And so we're going to talk about the mechanics underlying that and going to give you some tools to empower you to face the challenges that you have in your life. Okay? But first, I have a question. How many of you know what to do, but you're not doing? You know what to do, but you're not doing. Come on, keep the hands up. Let's see. Yeah, sometimes? Pretty much everybody, sometimes. We know what to do, and yet we do something completely different. So why is that? Are we lacking information? No, because we know what to do, right? So why is it that you know what to do, but you don't do it? notice it. We want to develop awareness of it. In psychology, they call this name and tame. By talking about it, by saying, oh, I feel a craving. Yep, I want chocolate. I just caught myself. I caught myself walking towards the chocolate thing at the grocery store. Or I caught myself going to a restaurant that has spaghetti or pizza, whatever it is. We comment on it out loud. We talk about it. We describe it. What does that craving feel like? Where is it? Is it in my stomach? Is it a tension somewhere? Am I feeling stressed? Am I feeling anxious? You do an out loud inventory of what it is that you're actually experiencing, what it is that you're actually feeling. And in order to do that, you have to give some blood back to this guy. Because when you're under stress, this is when you make bad decisions. Because the mammalian brain is in control. And the part of you that thinks about the future is up here. Your prefrontal cortex is the only part of your brain that can think about the future, that even knows what a future is. The other parts of your brain are about survival in the moment. Only this guy understands what a future is. Only this guy knows the future impact of your choices. So when it's turned off because you're under stress, you don't see the future. You don't see the impact. It's like you're, in fact, if your left side has any blood going to it at all, it'll come up with a justification why this is actually the best choice. It's not as if we take all the blood away. It's just we take most of it. We can still talk of it. And it's going to say, yeah, it's a good idea. It's a good idea. The mammalian brain will feed it or prime it, tell it what to do. So by describing it, by thinking about what it feels like, where I feel it in the body, thinking about where I feel it in the body, that lights up the right side, because this is connected to the body. And then putting words to what I'm feeling, that lights up the left side. And when we do that, when we light up this part of our brain, we take blood away from the mammalian brain. We take blood away from the stress response, and it goes down. So simply by talking about it, simply by being aware of it, we can reduce that stress response. And when we reduce the stress response, we reduce the craving. Whatever it is. You want to get in a fight with somebody. You want to say something. Something happened and you're pissed and it's a... Notice it. What am I feeling? I'm feeling anger. I'm feeling aggression. Where do I feel it? I feel it in my face. I feel it in my shoulder. I feel my hand clenching. I'm not going to hit them, but I still have this... There's tightness. Describe that. Feel it. Notice it. This is called mindfulness. Mindfulness wakes up the prefrontal cortex and down-regulates the primitive parts of your brain. It gives you a little bit of space. It gives you the ability to step back and say, okay, that's an experience that is moving through me. That is not me. It's moving through me. It's a wave that is moving through the ocean. It is not my identity. It is something that I'm rising and falling on. Ooh, I'm rising on anger. I'm rising on anxiety. And there it goes. 
If you can give yourself that space by describing what it is that you're feeling, describing where you're feeling it, you can give yourself enough space to often, but not always, bypass that impulse, bypass that craving. It takes about 90 seconds for the chemicals that your body produces that causes you to crave, that causes you to move, causes you to react. It takes about 90 seconds for them to leave the bloodstream. If you don't act in that 90 seconds, that wave will go down. For some people, it might be a little bit longer, but it's not super long. So we want to see it as an experience that moves through us rather than as us. I'm a bad person. I'm a weak person. I can't keep to this. I have no discipline. I have no willpower. Instead, we say, here's an emotional experience that's moving through me because a dent was triggered which caused me some form of stress. And it might not even really be a dent. I walk by and I say hi to someone, and, or it might not be a, a legitimate threat. I'm walking by, I say, hey, how you doing? And they don't respond. What does that mean? Did they not like me? Did I do something wrong? Or maybe they just didn't hear me. Again, our, our left brain makes up stories about what just happened. And then it tells us, oh, blah, 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 blah. You're, you suck, you're this, you're that, or they don't like you, or they're a jerk. And, hey, why are you such a jerk to me today? But when we can observe, we can notice, oh, they didn't respond, and now I feel this. I feel this in me. Okay, just talk about it. I feel it. You don't have to be it. I made a video a couple weeks ago where I was running on the Appalachian Trail and I was recording a note. I listen to audiobooks and I record notes as I go. And in the middle of my note, I was running down the mountain, which is very, very rocky. I kicked a rock at full speed and I broke my toe in the middle of my recording. But I have practiced this. This what I'm talking about now. I have practiced this for years now. And as I kicked the rock, in the middle of my recording, I said, wow, I just kicked a rock really hard. I think I broke my toe. <laughs> and I said, I can feel extreme intense pain. That's interesting. I feel the pain rising in my toe. And I'm talking about the experience on the recording. Like I caught the whole thing. And then I'm like, okay, after like 30 seconds, I'm like, okay, okay whatever. And then I got back to recording my note with a broken toe as I'm still running down the mountain. I didn't even slow down. And then I got home and I took my shoe off and it's just this giant, nasty, purple, twisted, lumpy mess. And it's like, oh, okay, well, I got a broken toe. And it's not like I'm tough. It's not like I'm insensitive. It's not like I can experience, I can handle a lot of pain. It's just that I've separated myself from the pain. The pain is no longer me. It's just something that moves through me that I can describe. I had another fall. There's a, you can see a little bit of a scar. I fell another time, trail running, not too long ago as well, fall a lot, <laughs> and I cut open my hand. And I got back to the house, and there was no hydrogen peroxide, we only had rubbing alcohol. And it was a pretty nasty gash. So I said, ooh, this is going to hurt. But I said to myself, you know, this is not the kind of pain of damage. This is not a pain that's a threat to me. This is the pain of healing. This is good for me. So this is the healing pain. So as I poured the alcohol in, I felt the pain, this searing, burning, like razor blades slicing my hand open. And I just calmly noticed it, and I described it. I talked about it. It's like, oh, that feels like razor blades cutting open my hand. <laughs> but it didn't bother me. It didn't bother me. I just talked about it, and I noticed it. And this is a technique that psychologists are now using, which is incredibly powerful. It's the best tool that we've got right now. Uh, in Boston, John Kabat-Zinn has a program where they do something called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, MBSR. And a lot of what I talk about is based on that as the foundation, and I've added some stuff to it. But this is incredibly powerful. This just isn't my opinion or my experience. This really works. And I'm a crybaby. I am a crybaby. That's who I am. I'm the kid that was always crying. I'm like, mm -hmm. Nothing was ever right. Nothing was ever good enough. Everything always hurt. 
now I can cut open my hand and have it hurt and say, oh, okay, there's the pain there. I notice the pain. All right. But the pain is not me. It's just moving through me. The craving is not me. It's just moving through me. This challenge or threat is not me. It's just moving through me. And it's coming from a part of my brain that is not conscious. It's coming from a very primitive and quick to react part of my brain. My job is to notice it, to catch it. What is the purpose of meditation? To clear your mind, to have a mind that's calm? To become aware. To be present, to become aware. To become aware of what? Aware of your thoughts, aware of your feelings. People think that meditation is all about sitting in a lotus position all blissed out. I'm calm, I'm peaceful, my mind is totally at ease. That's not the purpose of meditation. The purpose of meditation is to catch yourself thinking. To catch yourself ruminating. That's the purpose. Not to eliminate it. To catch it. When people try to eliminate it, it comes back. Ironic rebound, that beach ball. If you try to say, don't think about that, don't think about that, don't think about that, what's going to happen? You're going to think about it. So meditation is just noticing I had a thought. Don't make a story about the thought. Don't let the left brain go off and create a story. Just, I had a thought. There's another one. Oh, I just caught myself. I had a thought. Oh, there's some pain. Oh, there's some anger. Oh, there's some pizza cravings. It's about catching yourself. The more you practice this, the more you catch yourself, the easier it is to diffuse it, to take away its strength. But say the craving is so strong that even though you've named it, even though you've described it, even though you've placed it in your body, you're still like, okay, this is a big one. Naming it, describing it, and placing it will give you enough space to get into action to do something different. So something that I do, I get up in the morning, I don't want to run. I don't want a green smoothie. But if I can name and describe my experience when I wake up, which is usually rather unpleasant because I don't sleep. So I wake up in a depressed, underslept state most of the time. And if I say, this is me, this is my identity, this is what my life sucks, I've got no future, I've got no possibility, I don't want to do anything today. I say, no, this is, this is what I'm waking up with. Okay. I feel tired. I feel it in my eyes. I feel depression. I feel hopelessness. Okay, I notice that. All right. I don't see any possibility for the rest of the day. Okay, that's cool. That's fine. It's all right. Doing that gives me a little bit of space. And in that little bit of space, I can take a step. I can step towards the kitchen. I can step towards the blender. I can step towards the banana. I can step towards some kale. I can step towards some blueberries, which is what I did here this morning. Um, went out and got my own kale. <laughs> and brought it back. So that space can give you enough room to take a step away from the craving. So if you name it and you describe it and you don't change anything, you just sit there, okay, it's going to give you some space, but if you're still sitting there with the thing right in front of you that's confronting you, you're probably going to give in at some point. So you give yourself a little bit of room and then you take a step somewhere else. But not away from the food. Not away from the thing that you're challenged by because that's going to cause it to bounce back. We move towards something. We want to move towards something, not away from something. And if you keep doing that, if you keep moving towards, then you're far enough from the craving that you don't want it anymore because it's just, it lost interest. The mammalian brain can't think about the future. So if I can see it, I know that I can get it now. But if I can't see it, if I know it's 10 minutes away, if I have to go 10 minutes to get the thing, the mammalian brain is not that interested. 10 minutes is, is too far into the future. It wants it now. Give me something now. I smell the pizza. That means it's right here. I can get it now. I smell the cigarette. Ooh, cigarette. I want a cigarette. But if I've got to go into town to buy the cigarettes, it gives me time up here to make a different decision. Because these guys think about the future. So the naming and the taming calms the mammalian. 
and allows these guys to think about the future in that space that you create. It can be a good thing that it's delusional. Yeah, it can be a great thing. You can make up fun delusions. I made up a fun delusion that I was going to make an Olympic team. It's a delusion, but it got me here today. It got me into this great project over the last 10 years that has allowed me to, to become somebody that I never imagined possible. Didn't make an Olympic team, but I created all kinds of really cool stuff in the process. So that was a great delusion to have. But I also got the crap kicked out of me along the way. And this is where I started coming up with these tools. Because I kept getting beaten down. And my depression would be right there waiting, like with open arms, come, come to Papa, we'll take care of you. Let's just lie in bed forever and never do anything again. So I started researching, started studying, started coming up with these tools to find a way to get me in action again and again and again. So I don't have discipline. When I run every day, it's not discipline. It's describing what I'm feeling, placing it in my body, and then taking a single baby step in the space that's created, and then doing that again, and again, and again. I don't have to run 20 miles. I just have to put my shorts on. I then have to put my shoes on. I then have to put my shirt on. I then have to put my watch on. That's a hell of a lot easier than running 20 miles. I have to open the door. I have to pick up my foot. I have to lean forward. I have to fall and take a single step. And then I take another one, and then I take another one. And then before you know it, I'm running, and I forget the fact that I didn't want to run. And now I'm just running. I'm engaged. But there's a, there's, there's a consequence to your running. You, you feel good at it. So. When I run, the depression is gone. It's gone. It's gone for the rest of the day. So there's a huge benefit. So that space, by the naming and the describing, I create the space that allows me to take the steps to get prepared to run or prepared to do whatever you want. And now that I baby step myself through the preparation process, being very gentle, being very kind, and acknowledging what I'm feeling. Okay, I feel uneasy right now. Great, that's okay, I just, it's okay. And I say that to myself, it's okay, Tim. It's okay, it's okay. So, doing this process, you can accomplish just about anything. If I can become the athlete that I became, can become the student that I became, that I am now, with the life that I have in the past, the history that I have in the past, anybody can do it. I'm one of the toughest cases I've ever met. So I know it works. I mean, it's not just me. The data out there, the studies are doing show that it works, but I've tested it out and it works. So no matter what you're facing, knowing that it's not your fault, Knowing that you've been dented and you've got this identity that you didn't choose, that just happened to you. Knowing that you've got these different brain regions that want different things. And knowing that by using the smartest part of your brain to talk about what's happening allows you to regain control and see a future again. And when you can see that future, you're more likely to make a choice that's in alignment with your more positive goals. So that you can be compassionate, not just with yourself in the moment, but so that you can be compassionate with yourself in the future. Because if what you're doing is only about how I feel right now, well, what about the guy that I become 20 years from now? What will he think about the guy 20 years ago that made the choices that put him in the state that he's in? Am I going to set him up for success? Or am I going to set him up to fail? So when you wake this part of the brain up, you can see that future. And you can be compassionate with the feelings that you have now. And with the person that will have to deal with the consequences of your actions in the future. Okay? That's, uh, wow, that's an hour and 20 minutes. So I'm going to stop the talk, but I'll answer questions. I'm proud to announce the release of my free raw recipe app. Do you want over 100 original raw food recipes in the palm of your hand? Click the links to download or search Double Organic on your phone. Oh yeah, it's Double Organic. Did you know I offer raw food coaching? Comment, like, share, and subscribe. Got epic recipes, fitness, and raw food motivation. Connect with me on Facebook. 
Instagram, and of course, YouTube. Whoa, look at all those recipes. Those look tasty. Give me some of that. <laughs>